Okay, well, I guess I'll get started then. We're, it's about 10 past, I think. Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for coming to my talk. I'm delighted to be here, really excited to be in Sweden. Um, and I've been trying to learn as much as possible about the Swedish education system in just in the past week. Um, I'd love to hear more, actually, about the Swedish perspective on what I'm going to say today. So I'll attempt to both speak at a normal speed, but also leave time for some questions and some discussion at the end, because I don't know all the answers. I've got some ideas. I'd love to hear what you will think. So my, my talk is talk called Finland, Japan of the North? Question um, mark. So asking the question, are Japan and Finland quite similar educationally? So that phrase um, comes from the, think the 1980s, when the Finns would sometimes describe themselves as the Japan of the North because of their economy at the time. I'm meaning it, it in an educational sense. So um, why am I here at all? So um, I've had an interesting few years recently. Um, as I was saying in the panel discussion this morning, I'm originally a teacher. I got disillusioned with the English education system, um, became interested in policy and system structures, what other systems were doing too. Um, I did a, a master's degree looking at some of these things, reading about it, and thought, well, I can see all the stats here, and that's interesting, and I can read um, other academics' work about particular policies, and that's really interesting too, but I'd like to understand how, how do all those policies fit together in a particular cultural context. So this is what I did. So I approached schools under the radar. What I mean by that is I have not done this project in any official capacity. Um, it's not part of PhD research. I'm not affiliated with a university or with an institution. Um, deliberately so, because I wanted to get as much as close to a, a real picture as is possible, in, in the sense that I didn't want people to change their behavior or tell me different things because I was part of an official body or doing official research. So I emailed teachers, sometimes completely out of the blue, um, found their email address on the, went on the internet. Um, I emailed them saying, I'm Lucy, I'm a teacher. I'd like to find out some more about what you're doing and, and how you're getting these amazing results. Um, when, when I didn't hear anything back, I made a small video of myself to make myself look as sane as possible and say, hi, I'm Lucy. Um, <laughs> because not, not only was I asking to come and visit their school, um, I was offering to, to help out, and, and whether that was teaching or um, being a teaching assistant, and I was also asking if I could stay with them. So it was quite a big ask. <laughs> um, amazingly, educators around the world are fantastic, and this actually worked for me. Um, and I went to, to six different countries to study their education systems. So I lived with teachers. Um, taught with them where possible. In um, those countries that did not speak English as a first language, I was more of more use. I was able to teach some English classes. Um, in other places, there was more um, teaching assistant um, work. I spent three to four weeks in each country. Two to three weeks of those were, were in schools, and I did spend at least one week, usually more, in just one school in each place with the idea being that the teachers from that place could get to know me, get used to me, um, and not be worried about the strange lady at the back of the room. So just to get as much of a, a sense of, of normal life as possible. Um, and I, I deliberately didn't attempt to, to find the best school. Um, I tried to find as much as is possible. I realize this is tricky. But a typical school, your neighborhood schools, and I went to, to three or four schools in each country. I interviewed teachers, students, parents, and policymakers. Um, and then, since then, came home, read a lot of papers, um, and have been identifying themes and commonalities across the, the five countries that I've done case studies on, um, from the conversations, my own observations, other research, and um, the, in the data, particularly from TALIS and PISA. What I should say, though, um, is what I'm not, what I'm not doing. Um, I don't think it's, it's the right approach when you're trying to understand education systems to try and find a magic bullet, to try and find one thing that if all countries implemented this one thing, that would lead to PISA success. I mean, I knew you all know this already, but education doesn't, doesn't work like that. Systems are complex things. Um, and I think a lot of the, the um, OECD's research, fantastic, and I'm, I've made great use of it, but it's quite high level looking for correlations, um, doing regression analyses, trying to find patterns in the, in the big data. Um, and I'm not sure that, that it's possible to find 
to, to find, you know, these one or two things lead to, to success. Um, I think you, you can certainly say that one thing might lead to, have more chance of leading to success, but it's in combination with other things. It's in a context. So it's not like physics. Well, I got told off for this earlier, because apparently physics isn't like this either. Um, but it's not just, you know, one input into a, to a student's brain, one output, which is PISA. It's more like this. You've got lots and lots of different inputs. You've got all of the policies. You've got their home lives. You've got the teacher's relationship with the student, um, their own individual characteristics. And then lots of things come out, not only the PISA data, but other important things. Yes, we, we'd like them to be very good at, at maths and reading, but not at the expense of their mental health, for example. So it's important to look at some of those things too. I think it should be more like biology. So when we're studying biology, if I was trying to find what makes, um, what makes someone really fit, and really healthy, I might um, look, at, look at their heart and look at the detail of that, not just that they have one, but what, you know, what's the structure of that heart, but I'll also look at how that's linked up to the other organs of their body. Apologies to people who've heard me say this already today. I'll move on. So, um, oh, oh, that's not what I was expecting. There we go. Um, outcomes that remarkably, of, of all the countries I went to, Finland and Japan, often on all the tables, seem to, seem to have very similar outcomes, which seems bizarre because they're obviously very culturally different. Um, these were supposed to all come up in a different way, but my, I don't speak computer. <laughs> not, not, not my strong point. So Japan, no, the fin Finnish ones are going to come up separately. Both Japan and Finland are top scorers in PISA, which is one of the reasons I decided to go to those. So Japan, fifth in 2012, sixth in 2009. Um, Finland, seventh and third. Um, when I'm giving these rankings, I've just taken an average of reading, maths, and science. Very, very broad brush. As some of you might have heard this morning, the rankings in themselves are a little bit of nonsense um, in that from one year to the next, if not new countries come in and they come in above you, you go down the rankings even if your education has stayed the same. So I predict that in um, PISA 2000 and, where are we? PISA 2015, coming out this year, um, we'll all go down, all of us, England, Sweden, Finland, because China is entering three more districts um, separately. So it'll probably go down by three places. Um, so that's just general top performance. It's also interesting to look at how, how those results are distributed. So um, only 11% in Japan score below level two in maths. Um, and level two is defined by the OECD, I've got the quote here, I think, as, below level two means you lack the essential skills needed to participate effectively and productively in society. So that's bad if you don't have those. We want those. Um, unfortunately, no country manages th to get all of their students to, to achieve that level. Um, the average across OECD countries is 23%. In Japan, it's only 11%. And in Finland, it's only 12%. So they don't have that many low performers compared to other countries. In addition, it's interesting to look at equity. So not only um, how many students manage to pass that, that low level, but also how does their background impact on their results. Um, and again, both Japan and Finland have relatively low impact of socioeconomic background on results. So equity is strong compared to other places. Um, finally, just, just two interesting ones, I think. Um, similar levels of reporting liking maths. Not very many. Um, Japan, 10% of eighth graders say they like maths. In Finland, it's only 9%. And that's compared to an average of 26%. And some, somewhere else that they come up, interestingly the same, was I was reading about um, teachers' um, subject knowledge, particularly in mathematics, um, and teachers in Finland and Japan both have quite a lot of um, subject knowledge, and yet, when they're asked how confident do you feel about your subject knowledge, they say, oh, we're not very confident, we don't really feel prepared. So perhaps, I'm, I'm not really going to come back to that one, but perhaps it, there's a, a culture of humility in which they think, well, I, there's so much more I could learn, I'm going to keep trying to learn, rather than saying, oh, yeah, I'm fine. Okay, so what are they actually doing? So I'm going to pick out three things of the, of the many um, that, that Finland and Japan are both doing um, and suggest to you that these things might be helping them to achieve those um, high quality and high equity results. Um, some of these will have, um, will have in common with Sweden, some of them won't, and I'd love to hear 
what you will think about that afterwards. So they get children ready for learning. What do I mean? Um, so in Japan, they start school at age six. Um, in Finland, they start school at age seven. Neither of these things are particularly remarkable. Um, lots of countries start school age six, and, and a few more start at age seven. Um, this, this really is in contrast, bring, during a contrast with England, where students start age five, um, and often age four. Um, and even in America, where although they officially don't start till age six, often at, at kindergarten, they will be doing quite formal learning, sitting down at desks, as part of the high stakes accountability testing culture. So, so although the school starting age might be the same in other countries, what's actually quite interesting about Finland and Japan is in both of those systems, they don't start formal learning until, um, until age six or age seven. And in Japan, even in, the in first grade, it's, it's quite play-based. There's not a huge level of academic learning expected of them at that age. Um, in both systems, um, almost all children, something 98% and up, attend play-based preschool or kindergarten the year before they start school. And what they're doing in that, in that year, and often before then as well, um, is getting them ready for school, but in not in a formal learning way. So they're focusing on them, then their non-cognitive capacities, as well as the kind of pre-learning skills, the voc vocabulary, for example, talking, t talking to, to adults, having conversations um, that, that then will help them further on with reading. Um, and this is research ed, so I'm going to bring some research in here that isn't just my observations. Um, here we go. So um, Sebastian Sugate, who's a New Zealander, did an analysis in 2009 of um, previous PISA data, um, and he looked at school starting age, and he found that, quite strangely, you might think, that even if you, s you start school at age five, um, you don't actually end up doing better than people who start school at age seven. Even though you've had a full two years extra teaching, you by the time you get to age 15, those differences have evened out, and in many cases, they've overtaken you. So not only does school starting age not seem to have an effect on academic outcomes, um, he also interestingly found that the variance was bigger in those systems that started school younger. So if you're starting school at age five, you're the the you'll have a bigger range of achievement, which makes it much more difficult then when you do start school to be teaching all of those children the same things because they've already that gap has already grown. In addition to that, um, in reading, if children that start younger, this is research from New Zealand, they're worse at comprehension. They suffer from higher anxiety and less positive attitudes to learning, um, which might not, not be that surprising. If, you start, if you, someone tries to start teaching you to read before you're developmentally ready to do so and you find it really hard, that's going to affect your motivation. Um, similarly in maths, so this is uh, different researchers. If anyone would like the references, please come up. I've got, I've got them all here. I just thought it would be a bit boring to have it all up here. Um, Cross, two cross-national studies, one, one comparing Slovenia and England, one comparing um, Finland, Shanghai, and Singapore, um, have suggested that... Um, da, 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 hang on. <laughs> starting early has a negative impact on, on some children's later skills, particularly the ones who struggle with maths anyway. They then don't necessarily develop um, as they do, equivalent children do when they start a bit later. So I think that that's quite key is waiting until children are ready to start school, and before that, working on the kind of skills that they'll need, the self-regulation, letting them play. I went to an interesting talk earlier about that need for play and, and how that develops their self-regulation um, so that when they come to school, they're ready to sit down and, and pay attention um, to things. So let's go on to that. Let's go on to formal schooling. Oh, just an aside. I thought it was quite interesting that they have 10 or 15 minute breaks in between all lessons. So that's it's like a reset. So Japan, I thought it was quite funny. You have children who, in, in between classes, you have children rolling around on the floor wrestling. Um, and the teacher is not concerned by this. Sometimes the teacher isn't there. Um, and they're just completely mucking around, going crazy, making loads of noise. Then the lesson starts. And it's, it's not formal learning sitting at desk being completely quiet in primary school. Um, but, but their attention is refocused. They're listening to the teacher. They're engaged in the activities. Second thing, they offer challenge rather than concession. This covers a whole number of things. Um, so let me tell you what I mean. So, so in both of these countries, there, there is a national curriculum. And there is an expected outcomes for students at every grade level. 
So in grade three, you are expected to be able to do X, Y, and Z, and all children are expected to reach that level. So rather than the, con the contrast being making concessions, so students obviously are different. Some find academic learning easier than others. Making a concession would be saying, OK, well, you can't reach here because that's too hard for you, so we're going to give you different work, and you can do this instead. You know, be we're going to make it nice to you. We're going to make a concession. You can do this easier thing. Japan and Finland are not doing that. So in terms of policies, this is coming up differently from what I expected. Sorry about that. Um, so Japan and Finland, they have comprehensive schools up to age 15, as you do in Sweden. So you don't track children into different schools based on their ability before then. They have mixed ability classes as well. So even within schools, so in England, we have officially, we have comprehensive schools in most areas. But then once they come in, age 11, we put them into different classes based on their ability, based on a test they took in their previous school. So if they thought they were coming in with a fresh start, mm -mm, they're going to be put in, in you know, set five. Already imagine the kind of expectations on them from the teachers, from on themselves. Um, and, and for both of those things, um, broader research, um, international research, has suggested that with comprehensive schools, um, if, you, if you delay tracking, so if you have an old, you're at an older age before you put children to different schools, that is better for equity um, and ha with no negative effect on, uh, um, on quality on grades. And in some cases, actually, so Poland, for example, which has been spoken about a few times today, um, one of the OECD's main ideas about why that reform worked is because they delayed tracking by a year. So they left it an extra year where everyone was educated together. Mixed ability classes, similarly, um, if you look at the big meta-analyses, like by Hattie, for example, um, the evidence suggests that setting, putting students into different classes doesn't help um, increase grades, but it does have a negative impact on equity. It means children who are weaker will do worse. Um, this is where it gets interesting, though, I think. I think that's fairly, fairly well-known um, research. But I, th well, I think this, this next bit's really important, too, is what's happening within the classroom. And taking exactly the same concepts of challenging everyone rather than making concessions, have a think about what, what people are actually doing in the classroom. So, so both Finland and Japan have two of the lowest percentages of teachers who report that in um, every lesson or most lessons, they give different work to different students based on their ability. Um, I have got some, some contrasts for you that might be interesting. So in Sweden, that, n that number's 53% of teachers say that they do it um, every lesson or often, compared to 22% in Japan, 37% in Finland. Oops. Um, in Norway, it's 67%, and Denmark is 44%. Um, and and I, I speculate, but I speculate having read quite a lot of things about Finnish history and pedagogy, that, that this number probably would have been a bit lower pre previously, because there, there, there is a bit of a drive towards more individualization in Finland so that this number probably would have actually been lower than 37% about 10 years ago. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slip. No, I'm not. I'll, I'll talk about this now. So, so it's not that they say, oh, you know what? Everyone has to get this high grade, and you're all the same, and we're just going to do the same thing of everyone, and tough luck if you find it difficult. That's not the approach. So same goals for everybody. Rather than giving them different work and saying, right, you're going to aim for this one, you're going to aim for this one, you're going to aim for this one. But different levels of support to reach that high goal. So in Finland particularly, I was really, really impressed. They have qualified teachers, often with master's degrees in addition in special needs, who will do small group work. So maybe take, help them in class, maybe pull them out of class. But it won't be the same group of children all the time, permanently, in a separate class. Um, with the exception, I must say, of children with... with um, Severe, more severe special needs. So there, are, there is a recognition that some children, it is just too much. And with the parents' consent, they might have a different class in a, a slightly adapted curriculum. But, mo but most children, they're all aiming for that high level. Um, not only do they have support from qu these qualified teachers, but if there are any other barriers to learning, if there's a social, for example, they have um, social workers on site in, in the bigger schools or that go from school to school in the smaller places, um, and they have psychologists that can deal with those needs as well. So they really look at what are the barriers to learning? How can we get rid of those barriers to help you reach this high stage? Um, Japan is slightly different. They, they're still aiming for this, thi this, this high level. Um, they have support from teachers, but it's the same teacher. It's the class teacher. 
And it might be a little bit during class, but mainly it's after class. It's in that 10 to 15 minutes in between the lessons. If you've got a bit stuck during the lesson, you'll come up to the teacher and say, I didn't get this, can you help me? So um, after school as well. But also, if that's not enough, parents take on a lot more responsibility for their children's learning in Japan. They, they think it's their, it's their responsibility to make sure their child is keeping up with this high level that's increasing every year. So they will help children themselves, and the fact that they have high quality sequenced textbooks help with that. Parents know what's going on at school. Um, and they also might send them to Juku, which is private tuition as well, to help them catch up. Um, so I wasn't going to talk about this, but I thought you'd all find it interesting. So I've added a bit of a maverick graph in here. Oh, that's not the graph. Oh, talk about that in a sec. This came out yesterday. Um, really interesting graph, I think. So let me explain what this is. So this is based on an analysis of um, PISA data. And in, 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 was it PISA or was it Talis? It is PISA. Um, they asked t um, students about their lessons and the kind of um, teaching input they had in their lessons um, and the way that they learned. Um, and they've broadly, um, they've based on certain questions, they've broadly defined those as, as teacher-directed strategies and student-directed strategies. And I'll show you before we look a bit more at this what that means according to them, because that's highly controversial in itself. So teacher-directed instruction for, for the purposes of this graph is teacher sets clear goals for our, for our learning, Teacher asks me or my classmates to present our thinking or reasoning at great length. The teacher asks questions to check if we've understood. At the beginning of the lesson, the teacher presents a short summary of the previous lesson, and the teacher tells us what we have to learn. So that's how they're defining teacher-directed instruction. Student-orientated instruction. The teacher gives different work to classmates who have difficulties learning and or to those who can advance faster. The teacher assigns projects that require at least one week to complete. The teacher has us work in small groups to come up with joint solutions to a problem or task. And the teacher asks us to help plan classroom activities or topics. So there's, as I think, I won't go into the history of this, I'm sure you're all fully aware of the massive debate that's been raging for centuries across continents with regards to this stuff, um, which is why I thought it's such an interesting graph. Um, so, so who, oh, well, I'm not allowed to move. I'm going to stay in the light. Um, so on this side, to the right of the graph, on the x-axis, this is more traditional, it's on the right-hand side of the graph. Um, more student-orientated orient is on the left-hand side of the graph. And the numbers along the bottom refer to the ratio of one to the other. So three in the middle there is three times as much that the children are talking about teacher-directed instruction compared to student-orientated instruction. So you can see that in general, every, everyone, every single country, is doing more teacher-directed than student-directed for a start. But how much they're doing it um, varies. The countries I've highlighted in, in yellow were the top 17 in maths. 17 because I, c I kept not wanting to exclude them because there was only one point difference each time. Until I got to 17, then there's a five point difference, so I stopped. But in case you thought I'm, I'm cherry picking here, the next three countries were Austria, Australia, and Ireland. So also on this side of the graph. So the countries that are doing well in PISA are, with the exception of Switzerland, all more teacher-directed than average. Now, you might not care about PISA, but if you do care about PISA, I thought that's quite interesting. Um, the, this y-axis is also interesting, but I won't dwell on it as much, which is um, up, up the top there is, is more memorization, so children committing facts to memory. Down the bottom is more elaboration, so children making connections, elaborating on concepts, um, that kind of thing. And you can see that's pretty, they're all kind of all over the place, but not the two extremes. So they're all doing, they're all doing more, um, they're all doing more memorization between one to one and two to one. More memorization than elaboration, but they're doing elaboration. I thought it was interesting you, what the UK is for anyone from the UK. Let's clock that. We complain that, oh, Asia, it's all learning facts, 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 and actually we're doing way more memorization than, than Shanghai or Singapore or Korea. So there you go. Right, the third, third one I'm going to talk about. What am I doing for time? Oh, better than I thought. Good. Um, so, so we talked about that early start. So you're not starting before they're ready, but you're preparing them through preschool. Um, I should have said, sorry, in both um, Finland and Japan, the preschool teachers are pretty highly qualified 
um, there's, there are regulations as to how many of them have to have degrees in early childhood education. So they're starting with a solid basis. There's not as much of a gap as those countries where they're starting early, which allows them to, in every year group, to have the same high goals for everyone and really you know, working with that support to try and keep everyone caught up, rather than dividing that into you're going to aim for different things. The other thing that helps them do that is having excellent teachers um, and knowledgeable teachers as well. Um, so in Japan, um, to be a teacher, you, you're te you have to have teacher training at a higher education institution. So no unqualified teachers in Japan. You might think, oh, obvious, no unqualified teachers. We're allowed to have unqualified teachers in schools in England. Yay. Um, it's highly competitive to become a teacher. The, the competition is at a different stage from Finland. So in Finland, it's really hard to get onto a teacher training course. In Japan, it's not as difficult, but then it's really hard to become a teacher once you have that teacher training. And it's based on an exam, interestingly. Not only an exam, but you do the, the first thing you do is you take an exam that's based on your subject knowledge, that's based on pedagogical content knowledge. So not just g generic pedagogy, um, but specifically, oh, I want to teach maths. What are children's misconceptions about this particular mathematical concept and what, therefore, is the best way to get around that? So they know that stuff and they're tested on that stuff. And it's only if they pass that exam that they even get an interview where they have to do a, a teaching practice and demonstrate their, their, um, their other skills. Once they start, they've got formal mentorship periods um, while on the job. And while I think officially it only lasts for a year, they, in terms of just talking to people, like uh, there was a teacher uh, um, who I saw observed who'd been teaching for five years. And then in, in the discussion afterwards, they, sa they said, oh, but this, this wasn't great, but then you've only been teaching five years. <laughs> you know, the, the, the expectation is you're continuing to improve for a quite a long period of time. And there's that, an apprenticeship model there. They have regular lesson study. So that means that, that groups of teachers will, of, of different experience levels, will plan lessons together. Um, and then one of them will teach it. And they'll all watch the students, the teacher as well, but they'll watch how the students are responding to this. So they're not, it's not about judging the teacher, although they'll also get feedback, but about judging the lesson that they've, they've planned together. How, how is that working? What should we change? Do we need to tweak things? Um, so lots of professional conversations. Um, and expert teachers feed into textbooks. So they have high quality textbooks. Something I d didn't say earlier is that um, another similarity between the two countries is that both use have a high use of textbooks in lessons. So fairly, fairly traditional. Um, traditional, but with lots of, lots of elaboration, lots of student discussion. It's not a case of lecturing, although it includes lecturing, certainly in the case of Japan. But then lots of, um, there's lots of active learning, but it's active in here rather than necessarily active everywhere else. Um, Finland, um, highly competitive to enter a teaching course in the first place. This 10 to 1 figure is bandied around a lot. Um, I actually think that that's um, when it's only primary education, and it might even just be Helsinki. Does anyone want to fact check me? Yes. OK. Okay, yeah, thank the you. The figure helpful. 10 to 1 is in some places, and it's also included in Mackenzie's, so that's why it's so widespread. Okay. Uh, but but if, you, if you ask uh, at, at the central level for the overall, they say it's 5 to 1 okay. if you take many, many of them together. Thank you. That's, that's really helpful, because I couldn't find that data. 5 to 1. But still, that's pr still pretty good, isn't it? Five people applying for every teacher training place. That allows the education tra trainers to be quite picky about who they take on. Um, and they have five years at university. They're, they're here's a key difference, though, between the two countries. They're obviously not all the same. Um, there isn't the same culture of lesson observation in Finland as there is in Japan. There's, there's professional collaboration, certainly, and teachers will plan together and talk about their practice. But it's not an expectation that teachers will go and watch each other. And certainly in the schools that I went into, it wasn't the norm. I'm not saying that doesn't happen, but it's not a cultural tradition as it is in Japan. And again, expert teachers feed into textbooks, which are quite widely used. Um, now, I know it's all very well me saying that, because that's not that easy to copy, is it? You can't just say, right, what we really want, let's, let's legislate for having lots of people applying for teaching. Um, and partly, it's luck, I think, in terms of the, the history and the culture of each place. So in Finland, um, 
teachers are traditionally highly respected and actually seen as nation builders because, as, as you all know, Finland for a long time was, was under foreign rule, Sweden and then Russia. Um, so, so for them it was, we're going to be Finnish, you know, and the way we're going to be Finnish is through education. So the teachers were really respected in, in that sense. Um, I don't think that that necessarily would have lasted this long. People still want to be teachers, though, if that was all it is. Um, and I think the fact that they are respected, they have so much training, you know, having that much training and being respected, I think, feed into one another. This is getting into I thinks. I acknowledge this. This is what I think. Um, and also the fact that they have quite a lot of autonomy over, over how they teach. Um, and, and, it, and that autonomy is safe to do. As a government, it's safe to give them autonomy because they're highly educated. So it's a, it's a lovely kind of positively reinforcing loop. Um, Japan, they're not as highly respected anymore, although they don't feel as highly respected. They certainly traditionally were. Um, but they're still decently paid. So in both places, teachers are, are paid a starting salary that's equivalent to other professions. Um, and in Japan, that, that was a conscious decision to up teacher salary so that they could continue to get um, the best people applying. That's all I have to say on, on, on the teachers being knowledgeable and respected for now. I'm sure I've missed out something, but we can have a discussion in a minute. Oh, so I was going to talk about a whole other thing, and then I thought, if I try and do that, I'll talk too fast. So I've left it out. But... I, in, in relation to various other conversations I've heard happening today, I thought it'd be interesting to share a graph with you um, because um, P PISA has been accused of being super neoliberal and you know all of the different countries are bringing in free schools and they're bringing in competition and privatisation. And that is not what the data supports at all. Um, so if you look at, at this graph, this is a use of achievement data for accountability purposes. So the bar is um, the proportion of students in schools where results are published publicly. So, for example, for the, for the sake of league tables, so parents who can compare results in different places. Um, and the black, the black one is tracked over time by an administrative authority. So, for, for me, I mean, I think tr tracking over time really depends what you then do with it, doesn't it, as to whether that's a good thing or... I, I would imagine you would agree with me that, that tracking to some extent is important. It's what you then do with that information that, that is helpful or not. Um, but yeah, have a look at the, the countries right at the top. United States, not a high performer in PISA. Netherlands is doing very well. Really want to visit. Really want to find out about that. Um, United Kingdom, please don't copy us. Um, <laughs> Sweden, I equally, like I think, pretty average performance in PISA. Um, and very interesting talk just now about possible causes of that. Um, New Zealand, their results have gone down. It's not, you know, it's not a um, wall of a wall of fame up there. Down the bottom, Finland, Belgium, high performer, Shanghai, top performer, Japan, high performer, Austria, high performer, Switzerland, high performer. None of them are publishing data. So just just to kind of cut that one down before it gets out out of the box anywhere. It's it's certainly piece of data does not support administrative accountability, so the publishing of data, um, the kind of thing that, that, that we're doing in England and the United States of, of having um, punitive accountability in relation to that performance. That's not supported by the OECD, and they don't say that either. And in addition, um, I forget which OECD report, but I could find it if anyone's interested, they do, they do actually say that, that um, school competition, competition between schools, leads to greater inequity without improving quality. So that's, that's there in the data from an economic organisation. So there you go. Just thought you might be interested in that one. So I think that is all I have to say for today, but I'm very keen to, to have a discussion with you all if we have time. This graph came from one of the OECD reports. I can find out which one and email it to you. Yes. Thank you. 2013, what makes schools successful? <laughs> okay. So, so I've, I've just put a little summary of what I've said there. Oh, and uh, I'll leave that up rather than putting the any questions slide up because it's more informative. Hi. Right. Um, so you mentioned a lot of similarities. Yes. Um, but what about the private tuition, like after school learning mm. with mm. private teachers? Mm -hmm. In that case, I guess Finland and Japan is not very similar. Absolutely. Yes. So, so they're certainly not similar in every way. 
Um, I've kind of picked out the kind of key, key ways in which they are, which I thought was quite remarkable. But, but absolutely, Japan is in Asia and therefore does a lot of the Asian things, thinks a lot of the Asian ways. Um, and private tuition is, is definitely more common in Japan than it is in Finland. Although you would also think that maybe in Japan they're swatting for hours at home, doing tons of homework. Homework in Japan and Finland are actually quite similar in terms of how much time they spend on, on math homework each week. So I think, I suppose my point is not that they are the same, but that they're more similar than you might think. Hi. On the first topic you mentioned about um, early school age, uh, that's a very difficult one. Mm. Because in some countries, uh, if you look at early uh, childhood education, uh, it's not officially school, but it's sometimes very closely related to school. Mm -hmm. While in other systems, um, uh, it's more diverse. And it's very hard to pinpoint if it's in fact, F F I know from two um, meta-analysis that look at all the research, mm. and they only could conclude that it's not very clear. But one thing you mentioned, uh, I th that the effect diminishes, has a lot to do with what happens afterwards, yeah. not really what is happening at an early age. Um, there is the famous uh, James Heckman quote, mm -hmm. and a dollar invested in a child at an early age will uh, get a tenfold back, at the Heckman curve, but he adapted himself, his theory, because it's the importance is sustaining. Mm. And so it's very difficult to say that that age to start with is good or bad. Actually, it's more we don't know that well, I think, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in my humble opinion. Sure, sure. So so I suppose absolutely agree it's not to do with school starting ages, to do with what they're doing in preschool and what they're doing in school, because actually there might not be that much difference. And I'm, I'm not saying that I'm not saying that starting later leads to better results. Um, I'm just, uh, the, the Sugate study suggesting the variation, I thought, in results was interesting in that it makes it easier to then have a truly comprehensive education system if you're waiting till all children or m most children are developmentally ready. Um, and there are quite a few studies uh, which I can share with you that, that have explicitly said, so comparing England with other places, that have explicitly said that too early a focus on formal mathematics um, and, and formal learning to read has had a, a negative impact in the longer term. So I'm sure, I'm sure there will be some interventions that that are very positive and very helpful, but it's, it's specifically that formal academics at a young age rather than interventions per se. Any more questions? No? Okay, I'm going to have one more thing to say, which is that, oh, that I have written a book uh, about my travels in five different countries. Um, it, it's it's not an academic book. It's lo lots of stories and explanations, and but bringing in the theory too. If you are interested in reading it, you can. It's not out yet, but you can pre-order it or read about it um, at the website here, unbound.co.uk forward slash books forward slash cleverlands. Um, it's coming out in December, just before the PISA results. Um, look out for it. <laughs> okay, thank you.